before I tell you more about it. Um, but it's it's a uh, different technology. Something like the Biomat? Uh, better. Really? Well, that's great. That's infrared. And even the cat goes and has therapy on the Biomat yeah, every day. I wasn't sure about the better, just yeah. different. <laughs> yeah. He loves that Biomat. Uh, see, they're bothering him, too. So he could, just goes on, lies on that, and the infrared screws it all up. Because infrared is the information flow through the body. And that's what um, creates thought. It carries all the messages and the signals around the body. All that stuff I was talking about, that's what ionizing radiation messes up. You know what's really weird? We saw a person have a seizure the other day. Yeah. And so we had to wait an hour and a half because they had to call an ambulance and come get the guy. And it was like a really young kid. Yeah. And I was telling one of my, my daughter at State about it, and she saw someone have a seizure. And my other daughter saw somebody have a seizure. This was all in the same day. Yeah. And it's um, probably correlated with the high radiation levels. You know, they had 10 Becquerels in San Diego with no explanation for it. Yeah. The the atmospheric level was 10 becquerels. Five is absolute mandatory evacuation. The new fog. Yes, the new fog. Wow. And then there were um there were reports uh nobody knows what's happening of course of um sea lions of uh, all kinds of sea mammals, orcas, washing up with uh, sores all over their bodies, their bodies full of pus, cancer everywhere, and, I made. and uh, the, the pupping is only 20% of what it should be, and the, and the pups are completely emaciated. There's no food. Look what Dana reported off the coast of... Um, uh, British Columbia. He went up and down the coastline. Did you see his movie? Yeah, yeah. He's he's about a week into his trip. I he's know. Going, he's going to be going all the way up to the Northwest Territory. That's great. That's, yeah. He's he got a gear. really, really nice outfit. Yeah. Know, with cameras and everything. So, I mean, he's really... Donate. I, I'm, I'm really worried about him. Oh, he'll be fine. He'll yeah. be fine. And he's so well known now. They're they're not going to bother him. Um, he's too well known and in a wheelchair. People know he's in a wheelchair. They're not going to bother him. Um, when he when he gives when he does another show. Yeah. Like an actual if he does an actual show where he's got good enough reception and takes maybe a, a break, you know. Yeah. I'll let you know. Okay. So you can watch if you're around. Oh, I love watching his show. <laughs> he talked... He's so funny. I mean, he's such a sweetheart. He is a very sweet man. Um, and as time goes on, he'll get more comfortable with um, presenting. And, you know, we all had to learn the same thing the same way. It's by doing it. And then as the... As he gets more involved in the seriousness of the issue and wanting to make sure people understand, he will be a better presenter. Yeah. He just doesn't know how to do it yet. Right. But he. What he does is fun. <laughs> yeah, but what he does is fun. Yeah. Hello. He makes the point about the ocean. Yes. Those, his film was so shocking. Is that done yet? Okay, we are rolling. Oh, we're on. Okay, let me start my recorder. Okay. So, do you want me to talk about Vigner Dust? Yeah, well, we can, um, a, a, a easy explanation for Vigner Dust. Yeah. And then we'll have, um, Larry read point f five and six. Okay. What do we know about buildup of static electricity right. in the aircraft? Since we're talking about energy, now we'll get into electricity and aggregation kinetics and are the planes picking up the rads. Okay. Oh, and I'm going to read that list. Okay. Too. But go, you, 
can do your Wigner dust. Just ask. Just ask me when you want me to talk about it. Okay. Uh, to be yeah. I mean. Right now, you mean? Yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Wigner dust is produced in high temperature events uh, with radioactive materials. And an example would be Fukushima in the reactors where the, um, the fuel was melting and uh, caught on fire. And that smoke um, is full of Wigner uh, nanoparticles. In other words, uh, this black dust that is mostly uranium and plutonium spent, uh, not spent fuel, it's the, um, the, the fuel that was not completely used or was fresh in the reactor. So that would be, redu that would be producing uh, a lot of uranium and plutonium Wigner dust uh, mixed with the fresh fission products that uh, from the fuel that had already fissioned and released its heat, its energy. Now, uh, in the spent fuels, where the spent fuel rods were stored, those were damaged by the earthquake and the water drained out almost right away. So it's guaranteed that there were fires in those spent fuel rod pools that released huge amounts of black dust and um, those were almost more dangerous uh, that dust was uh, almost more dangerous or probably was than what was coming out of the burning reactor uh, and its fuel because the, the nearly 2,000 radioactive isotopes were um, in huge amounts in those spent fuel rods and there was less uranium and plutonium because that had already released its energy and transformed into other radionuclides. Um, the combination of those two was horrendous and is horrendous and that black dust was picked up in Norway just days after the explosion in uh, Building 3 and Building 4. So um, this nuclear power plant at Fukushima is still having events, fission events, uh, neutron pulse events, burning events. Uh, there's no way to control it. It's completely out of control. And then underground, these explosions underground from the, um, the, molten, spent, uh, the molten fuel that dripped out of the reactors is causing more releases of radioactive steam and uh, particles, radioactive particles in that, the black dust in that. And we're probably starting to see some hydrovolcanic there. Yes, that is the ex underground explosions, are called hydrovolcanic explosions. They're like a volcanic explosion. And um, so this Wigner black dust is being released every day in huge volumes it's being picked up by wind currents in the atmosphere and air movements and by ocean currents and it's being circulated and carried everywhere into all the oceans into all of the air column it's completely it's being raised up into the air and circulated should be cool okay all right you were saying that this Bigner dust is, and then you cut it out would be about 30 driven seconds. up into the okay. air and distributed yeah. on currents. Yeah, this Wigner dust has been released 24 hours a day into the atmosphere, carried on air currents and air movements. It did not get distributed. Uh, by the Gulf Stream, uh, by the um, the jet stream, uh, many people have said that that's an error. That happened during nuclear bomb tests when they were injected very high into the jet stream or near it. This has been released from the ground, and it is air currents and ocean currents 
and different circulations at at every uh, every level of size in the ocean and in the atmosphere. Uh, for instance, Neumann and um, uh, von um, von von Neumann. Uh, von Neumann, Vortices, and 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 Kerman, von Kerman, I think it's von Kerman, Vortices, and these are tiny circulation vortexes, just like a hurricane, but these are on the scale of inches or feet or or yards, uh, much smaller, and so you have constant mixing at every level. Uh, in the atmosphere and in the oceans, those it's called fluid dynamics, whether it's water or air, and it's actually how they use harp to heat up air and make fences or conduits to send the contaminated Fukushima air currents into targeted areas, targeted populations, and I watch them do that. I watch that every single day. There's no doubt at all that they are targeting populations. And what they're doing, for instance, uh, the Queen and uh, the British government have said they're taking over the southern island of New Zealand. They're just, they're just removing it from the country of New Zealand and making it her private mining headquarters for the mining projects in Antarctica. And um, she's a sovereign queen, so it's she can do anything with with any property in the Commonwealth that she wants to, and the people too. They belong to her. That's what sovereignty means, a sovereign monarch. And um, um, so I saw them. Uh, this is the harp. The U.S. Navy doing this, but also England has uh, uh, control of harp. And what they were doing was capturing or funneling radioactive polluted air uh, down through the um, the Pacific, the middle of the Pacific, and they were joining it up with the um, the Antarctic circulation and contaminating New Zealand and Australia. And then I saw them pulling it straight up into Southeast Asia through. Uh, the island arcs there across Africa into the Pacific and into the Mediterranean and the European countries. So they are definitely targeting populations and regions for this new world order uh, depopulation for land grabs for whatever they want to use them for. And it's so obvious and it's so disgusting and it's so destructive. They are erasing the history of humanity on this earth and they are irreversibly changing the genome of the entire planet and they don't know what they're doing. It took five billion years, four and a half billion years for life to evolve on this planet and they've destroyed it in 50 years. And life evolved on this planet during that time without man-made radioactive materials in our environment. That's in right. In fact, from an engineering perspective, we had to wait for entropy to remove enough of these radionuclides from the troposphere, the environment within which we would be developing, so that we could develop. We had to wait our turn while this place cooled off. Yes, because the the... Um, the dust field, it's, it was like a platter uh, or a plate or a frisbee that um, our solar system formed from had many radioactive materials in it because remember where they come from, supernovas and other star processes that produce stardust. And our solar system is made from stardust. We're made from stardust. And we are just in a unique um, environment that's exactly the right distance from the sun for water to be in liquid, solid, and gaseous form on this planet. And that made life possible here 
under very unique conditions as compared to other planets. Um, it's, it's so fascinating. Science is so fascinating. The universe, the solar system, matter and how things happen and why and, and what the experiment produces. Um, the Earth is a beautiful planet. It's a very unique planet. And life, being a part of life on this planet, is really, really um, a tremendous piece of good luck for we the people. In combining several different branches of science, is the only way we could really do this interview today. That, that's right. We're mm -hmm. combining chemistry um, and, and radiation, nuclear science, physics, um, mm -hmm. physics, aviation, engineering, economics. And I don't know anyone else that has covered this at all. No one has. It's co always compartmentalized can't make sense out of it. You don't have enough of the pieces to see what the big picture is. It's interdisciplinary and there's no discipline. There's nothing on this planet that radiation doesn't touch. For instance, um, we have a gravitational field. We have gravity on this planet. We have a magnetic field on this planet. And it's because the interior of the Earth is molten. And it's hot in the interior because of the uranium dust that was in the original formation of the solar system, which is inside interior in our planet. And the heat over millions of years, billions of years, that was released by tiny radioactive uranium atoms has accumulated and accumulated and accumulated so that there's enough heat in the interior to make part of it liquid. There's motion in and layers in the interior of the earth that create a dynamo that, um, that produce a magnetic field. And so other planets that are closer to the sun or further away do not have magnetic fields. They don't have circulation in inside the planets. Unless they're molten. And that's from uranium, believe it or not. Well, you've had some uh, extensive experience in tracking disease and fallout and weather with the atmospheric sciences that you've studied. And we had originally intended to track every single airline event from the time that we started doing this in late February, early March. But the list became too massive. <laughs> so we're going to um, publish those events in their entirety on the internet following this interview, but I wanted for... Um, for purposes of comparison, because of the high radiation levels that have been recorded throughout the country in the past seven to ten days on the West Coast and Texas, Gulf Coast, Coast states, and areas where there was very heavy rainfall in Nebraska, Iowa, the Midwest, and the St. Lawrence Seaway, there's also been a number of plane emergencies. So I'd like to just briefly go through that list starting from September 5th till now. And, um, Christina, I want to really thank you and the people who have volunteered to help you collect this data. This is really a landmark interview. It's a very, very important interview. And they'll, there will be many, many people who get uh, critical information that they really need. These would be pilots and, and crews and all kinds of people will use this information in this interview. And I really want to thank you for all of the work you've done, for your level of competence, for your integrity, and um, you're just wonderful. Thank you, Christina. 
Thanks, Loren. I, I love doing these interviews with you, too. And <laughs> we have a lot of fun off camera as well. <laughs> yes. Then we'll, we'll put out a, a blooper reel one of these days, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, starting September 5th, there was an engine shutdown in flight on a Trans Aero Boeing B767 in Barcelona, Spain. I came across this on YouTube, actually, when a passenger filmed flames bursting out of the left engine, and then the engine subsequently shut down, and the plane was forced to have an emergency landing. Also, on September 5th, there was an unresponsive pilot that led to a plane crash in the sea near Jamaica. This was at least the second and possibly the third event in two days of a pilot passing out in flight. F-16s were sent up to escort the plane. They saw the pilot was hunched over at the controls, and they have not found the wreckage of that plane yet. Oh, so it crashed. Yeah, it was um, a, a gentleman, I believe his last name was Glazer. He and his wife, he's a property manager in New York of a real estate company. And she died too? Yeah. So oh. this was a propeller craft? Yes. Private plane, yeah. On September 6th, in California, there was a small plane crash in Warner Springs. Warner also, Springs, so that anybody and everybody knows, is a naval installation. It is a high desert training area. I attended the Survival Evasion Resistance and Escape School at Warner Springs. It's above Miramar. Also on September 6th in Iowa, there was a farm helicopter that crashed in Potawatomi County. And the NTSB had released a report in March of this year saying there had already been 10 helicopter crashes in the first three months of 2014, and that was far beyond anything else they had ever observed statistically, and they have not offered an explanation for that. There's a lot of that going around. Vigner. It's Vigner. On September 7th in Minnesota, there was a fatal plane crash north of Montevideo. On September 8th, in Colombia, there was a plane crash killing 10. Also on September 8th in New York, two were killed when a small plane crashed into a rail car. Also September 8th in Nevada, one was killed in a plane crash at a national championship of air races during a qualifying run. Mm -hmm. On September 9th, there was a plane crash in Mexico leaving five dead. That was in Sonola. Sinaloa. Sinaloa. Mm -hmm. Also September 9th in Texas, there was a plane crash that near La Porte. Also September 9th in Connecticut, there was a plane crash in Watertown. Are these commercial or private or mixed? Mixed. Okay. Most of them are private small planes. Yeah. On September 10th in Virginia, there was a small engine plane crash near I-77 in Carroll County pilot was injured. On September 10th in Texas, a pilot was killed when his plane crashed near Austin Airport. On September 11th, there was a small plane crash reported at Cascade Airport in Idaho. September September 11th, there were two fighter jets that crashed in the Western Pacific, reported by the U.S. Navy. They have not given a reason for that crash. Is that like over by Okinawa? Or I didn't believe know? it was, it was, uh, I want to say that it was near Guam, but I'm uh -huh. not positive, and I, I, there may have been a drill going on in the area. I'm sorry, 250 miles west of Wake Island. Oh, Wake Island. Uh, okay. There were two fighter jets that crashed. Yeah. Out in the middle. Yeah. <clears throat> also, September 11th, a UPS cargo plane had an emergency landing due, due to hydraulic problems. <laughs> we know Sep what that is. <laughs> September 11th, a military plane crashed in Gulu. Pilot ejected to safety. They have a reason on that one? No. 
September 12th, plane flips while landing at Austin Executive Airport. This was the second plane crash there in a week. Wow. Ground loops? Ground loops. Jesus. Somersaults on the runway. Oh, let's see. Wow. Here. On September 13th in Maryland, small plane flips over at Maryland Air Park. That may have been weather related. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Also, uh, there's seven events, six or seven events, just on September 13th. Alaska, there's a small plane that crashed near Mount Susitna. In the United Kingdom, man injured after North Chapel plane crash. In Georgia, woman hospitalized after a plane crash in Walton County. In South Africa, two were injured in East Rand. When a plane crashed also in South Africa, same day, two hurt, were hurt in Alistair during a small plane crash. And today there were three events, September 14th. In Canada, there was a plane crash near Brigden. There was a small plane crash, three were killed in Slovenia. And in Moot, Mudgee, Australia, two died in a, in a small plane crash. So mm -hmm. this is just the last eight, nine days, what's eight, happened. Eight. And there were only two of these published in mainstream media. One was the Jamaican flight, because it was being tracked all over Twitter at the time uh, when it occurred. And then there was a missing, there's another missing plane that's not even on this list that had left the Dominican Republic on the 12th. And that plane has not been heard from, and no wreckage has been found. David Rockefeller's son was killed in a plane crash uh, on his father's birthday just a couple of weeks ago. With the small planes, you're looking to, for a couple of different indicators. And in a lot of cases, this is going to be Wegener, but there are many other reasons for small plane crashes. And in three cases that we're certain of, uh, the case of uh, John Kennedy Jr. Uh, oh, yeah. The Wisconsin uh, senator, uh, his name escapes me right off of the Wellstone. top, right? Well, Wellstone. Yes, and uh, David Rockefeller's son. Well, those were prearranged events. That's oh, yeah. definite. So you've got that small planes, uh, maintenance, and actual handling. Uh, you have a lot more trouble with crosswinds, that variety of things. So. On an examinational basis, statistically, I'll give you odds right now that better than 70% of it's coming up from Wigner. Yeah. Aren't small planes, though, that are privately owned usually better cared for? You know, the pilots do their own inspections. They do their own inspections. They do their own maintenance. Allow me to suggest that uh, entropy is starting to set in with a, a lot of processes, including human processes. That's right. And there are other forms of, of active interference uh, occurring in targeted locations that I think will increase over time in America. Yeah, he's right. All right, should we have Larry read five and six so we can get a little more into the well, we were, possible buildup of, of rads on the aircraft itself. Well, sure. We were going to go ahead and examine the effect of uh, static electricity and its contribution to all of this. It's, it's addition to principles of attraction, that variety of thing, and scavenging. I think Loren probably like to cover that one. <laughs> sure. Um, as a plane is flying through a contaminated air column, for instance, uh, um, a Trans-Pacific flight from China or Taiwan or Japan to the west coast of the United States, um, it's traveling through different uh, radioactive levels depending on the altitude and even an inch or a couple of inches can have a different radiation value contamination value than just a few inches away um, it, it just depends on many many complex factors and the surface of the plane has a charge on it 
And so the radioactive particles that have an opposite charge will be attracted to the um, uh, charges that are opposite to it on the surface of the plane. So that, um, that radioactive particle will steal or rip off an electron from the metal crystal matrix or structure uh, on the surface area of the fuselage. As that happens, it weakens the metal and parts, especially thin metal, it's interacting with the surface of the metal. And as more and more uh, exposure occurs or more and more radiation is interacting with the surface of that fuselage, um, it's creating Wigner crystallization, which is crystals that grow vertically from the surface of the metal. And this can be blown off as that, that dust that we're talking about, black dust. Um, it depends on the material, the alloy, the, the thickness of the metal that's on the fuselage. Um, as I said before, the really thin metal that's used for crimping on, on hose, crimping hoses onto fixtures and so forth is very, very susceptible and plus it's under high pressure in the hydraulic system. So we're going to see more and more surface damage on commercial planes, especially because they fly, they fly so frequently and Christina, you really should uh, describe that flight you went on where you changed planes twice on each leg of the flight and what you saw on those planes. Um, another thing is that on the daily uh, plane accident incidents website, it's uh, for the whole planet, you can see that for the United States they have the highest rate of airplane incidents in the world and I suspect that this is not only the high radiation exposure here but also the um, scrimping on the maintenance of planes in the United States as our economy is in decline and so in order for the airlines to save money or to make up for losses um, in, from different causes they're scrimping on the maintenance and the care of the planes and I would like you to describe what you saw on the wing surfaces of the planes you were flying on and the airline because I'm going to make sure I never fly on that airline. Not that we would ever fly anyway. <laughs> yeah, not anymore. <laughs> Go ahead. Christina? Hello, Christina. What happened to her? We're connecting. I you can't tell us. you where we lost it because I never got a visual indicator. Yeah. How long have we been cut off? Oh, just I had just started talking about the trip. Oh, I, I okay. Hear you, you know, it's really weird because it's like all of a sudden there's this major static noise. Yeah. This is every time it's cut out, it's done this. Uh, because we don't hear anything on this side, so it's probably um, it's probably on our end. Yeah. And it's it's probably wireless. Yeah, it's a, it's a very strange disruption. Yeah. Um, it's definitely disruption. That's exactly the right word. Yeah, that's for this what it phenomenon. is. Phenomenon. Yeah. And uh, it's done with flat array antennas. They've got some fairly good sized ones in here now for a local application. We're surrounded. In the, uh, in the houses around us. Militarized this particular segment of the neighborhood for two reasons. 
one of the reasons why is because they've taken College Avenue here in Berkeley, California. And what they're doing is they're using it as the, uh, the divide between what is on the hill or the, uh, the, elite. the elite areas and the areas inclusive of the new uh, laboratories, the new half a uh, half billion dollars worth of Queen uh, Elizabeth, laboratories installed for Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth donated five hundred thousand dollars. Five hundred million. Five hundred million to the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Mm -hmm. Half a billion dollars to build a research park, energy research mm -hmm. park, and that's where they're doing. They have their nanotechnology center. Um, so, um, private industry is taking over the University of California and the campus. Yeah, I could describe to you what it would take to make a clean room in order to do nanotechnology. It's pretty involved. Are you, are you there? Yeah, okay. So, you heard, um, me asking the question, and then you started to talk, and we got cut off. Yeah, did you hear me say nothing. I took a cue from mm. you of gathering data wherever I go? No, nothing. Ooh, why okay. don't we just pick up from yeah. there? So just okay. start there. In June of this year, I had a family emergency in Utah, and I wasn't happy about having to fly, knowing what I do about planes and, and what I had been studying intensely. Uh, but I had to go on the trip, so... Um, in, in all of the discussions with Lauren, what I've learned from her is to gather data wherever I go. So I use this as an opportunity to scout what is going on at the airports, what is going on with the planes, just from my brief perspective, which included four flights that were kind of zigzagged across the country because I had to make them on very short notice. I had to fly from Detroit to Chicago to Salt Lake City and then to Phoenix back to Detroit. And on every leg of the journey, all four trips, our plane was delayed significantly by maintenance issues. And while we are sitting on the tarmac, I start looking around at the other planes that are around us. And it was very obvious, and in fact I'll, I'll include some high resolution photos here when I, when I do the upload for YouTube of what the planes looked like, the domestic carriers versus the foreign car carriers. And it was very obvious in terms of maintenance and cleanliness and just the foreign planes looked like they were in such better shape than the American planes. Materially so, yes. Because they were. <laughs> and on one flight in particular from Phoenix to Detroit, there were eight strips of duct tape on the right wing, and I had placed all my seats in the same location for each flight so I could have like a comparison of what the right wing looked like from my perspective. And they call this speed tape in the airline industry. It's actually duct tape, but they call it speed tape because it sounds better. Very they special adhesives. <laughs> They use this over areas where there's, you know, corrosion and defects before they actually replace a panel or a part on an aircraft skin. And it was really concerning to see this. And when I got back and I, 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 I did a story on it for Climate Viewer with all of these pictures, you know, the, the people that contacted me were like, I would have never flown on that plane. And they saw the pictures of this wing. But you know, it wasn't just that. It was. It was everything. It was everything. The yeah. flight attendants all look sick, beaten down, and sick. They, and they were crabby. They yeah. were fighting with each other, arguing yeah. loudly, not caring who else heard. Yeah. In the plane, um, there was a lot of drama going on behind the scenes. And then there was like outright lying by the carrier, and this was Delta and American Airlines that I flew on. Delta's really, really run down. Yeah, the, the plane with all the duct tape on the wing, they said at the beginning we were going to be delayed because of a maintenance issue. They had to fix a tray table in the aircraft. And so about five minutes later, a guy comes in with a roll of duct tape and fixes the tray table. And then we sat there another 45 minutes while there were these loud bangs going on underneath the plane. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my God. 
That was the hydraulics. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the hammer. But I mean, it was it was quite an experience having that kind of like knowledge and perspective. And I know that there's a lot of issues with you know the maintenance and costs and the airlines losing money and it's they're skimping everywhere. Everywhere. I mean, the planes are unbelievably dirty inside. You know, the windows are so dirty, it's it's like a Petri dish. They are when dirty. You look, when you look at it, and, um, you know, I mean, that was my, my recent experience and one that I hope I don't have to repeat anytime soon. And I need to go back to Salt Lake City around Thanksgiving, mm. and I think I'm probably going to drive. Drive or take Michigan. a train. Yeah, take a train. Take a train. Um, you know, this is kind of, I mean, can you imagine if your dentist used duct tape to um, fill a tooth or, or cover a cavity or something? Um, the, they're, they're decaying from inside the airline. Um, they are. Uh, the thing I found more interesting was the description of that engine. The, the blow up and the flame out. Yeah. Jet engines are made up of veins. They look like they might be propellers, and in a way they are, but in another way they aren't. What happens is, is they're made to spin rapidly in order to induce air to be made to spin over them more rapidly. So at a certain point you build enough pressure so that you can light a big fire and you can have the escaping, the expanding gas from that go out the back of a jet engine. That's what it's all about. So those veins that are in there spinning at these incredible mm -hmm. speeds, they have to be kept very cool. So they've got micro holes drilled in them. They're made to be self-cooling to pass atmosphere. So now we're going through all of this radiation and it's being very very technically, carefully channeled in and through these veins, keeping them cool. And Vigner's happening very rapidly, and every now and then a vein breaks off. And when, a, when a vein breaks off, this rare metal starts burning as it's being blown out the back in that expanding gas. That's what she saw, and the rest of it was the flame out and the engine coming down. Um, there was another... Um electrical issue that we didn't cover and that's the batteries exploding in planes on the ground I haven't heard of them exploding in the air but they have exploded on the ground and that's reminiscent of a problem I believe it was Toyota had a few years ago when they had to recall lithium batteries these batteries that are exploding on the ground in airplanes are also lithium batteries. And what happens is the Wigner effects change or alter the gel that is in the battery and cause it to explode. That is definitely Wigner effects. And it could probably happen to uh, other types of batteries. I'm not familiar enough with batteries, but we hear of cell phones exploding and, and other batteries exploding. Something is causing this. It doesn't just happen. Sorry, I can't, I can't get my mute to work on there. I had to cough. <coughs> I'll put the mute on it later, dear. Okay. Don't worry. In, in terms of the the static on airliners, and, and by the way, those battery meltdowns that you're referring to, that happened on at least two or three occasions on Japan to, to Hawaii flights. That's right. Uh, the... And I believe it might have even been the same plane. They had a, an issue with the same plane and a battery a few months before that. Uh -huh. But with the, the static on airliners too, and trying to visualize what's actually happening, the way that it was explained to me is that you have this like transferring of electrons 
Yeah. That's aided by friction. And when a plane flies through air, there's friction. Kind of like when you rub a balloon against your hair and that makes your hair stick to the balloon. That same effect occurs on an aircraft because of the friction against the plane as it moves through the air. And then, because air is an insulator for electricity, when the plane is flying, this static charge on the airplane's skin actually builds up on the aircraft at a high altitude. It begins, it, it tends to become much larger because the air is acting as an insulator and it's preventing the excess electrons from returning back to the air. So the way that I'm, I'm picturing this with what I know about you know, aggregation kinetics and what we've been learning, what I've been learning about fallout for the last three and a half years, that it's almost like these planes are scavenging the radi radioactive particles out of the air. And if that is happening, what could pilots look for? What would be the most obvious signs in the aircraft skin are there any signs in the electronics before you know a, a catastrophic power loss occurs um, you know what could aviation mechanics actually look for well they should first uh, get a Geiger counter and do a survey on the surface of the of the plane what happens with radioactive particles is when they're in air masses um, they are nucleating agents for moisture. In other words, the moisture condenses and collects around that charged, highly charged particle or snowflake. And when enough water has collected on that particle, it, uh, it forms fog or rain or uh, snowflakes have very sharp edges and, and sharp tips and uh, they're very geometric and along those edges and the tips they're highly highly charged so snow actually cleans out 95 percent of the radiation in the atmosphere that it passes through so these planes that are flying through snowstorms or they're iced up on the ground or um, or they they do they're flying through a lot of rain clouds and stuff they're going to attract radioactive particles and when a particle highly charged radioactive particle has moisture on the surface whatever it lands on it sticks to it's called van der waals forces and you can never clean that particle off you cannot uh, decontaminate they tried to decontaminate ships that the Navy put out in the lagoons when they did the bomb test. They had to throw those ships away, like a hundred ships, including an aircraft carrier at Bikini Atoll, because they couldn't decontaminate it. And when you sandblast it, you drive the radiation into the metal even more. So there's no way to decontaminate. Um, when fighter jets are flying through the air column um, they're flying at very high speeds so they are um, being exposed to higher radiation levels than a plane a commercial plane that's flying slower um, and so you would expect to see the Wigner effects acting on uh, military jets faster than on commercial planes now, as far as the part of your question about the crew being able to look somewhere in order to see a record of these things, it would be mostly a question of what is available to them, made available to them, because we're in the age of fly-by-wire, which is another thing where you've got multiple computers and they're actually controlling the attitude surfaces, the ailerons, the rudders, uh, all of that on your aircraft. And what you're doing is you're inputting from your control harness, yoke, uh, your wheel and your rudder pedals, however it is the planes configured, to computers. And the computers are telling the plane what it is that the computers think that you have on your mind as the pilot. Fly-by-wire. So all of this telemetry is stored. 
when these planes are up in the air, the commercial ones, Rolls-Royce is getting a report every 10 or 15 minutes via radio telemetry on the performance of their engine. This happens from the moment that the plane is powered up until the moment that that plane is powered down. That's right. The information is somewhere. The question is, can you get it? Well, the Geiger counter measures the actual radiation. Um, in nuclear power plants, they x-ray or use some kind of intrusive technology to look at pipes uh, in the nuclear power plant carrying the cooling water in and out of it and um, where the pipes bend they have a joint there um, is where uh, there's more stress on the pipe and that's where a lot of the cracks and the fracturing occurs uh, in the metal they have special instrumentation and technology to look for cracks and weaknesses in the metal. Uh, they've told me about it. And that can be used on the commercial planes also. You can't really see radiation when it's low-level contamination. Yes, the non-destructive testing, or NDT. Yeah. <laughs> It's um, a group of analysis techniques right. that they can use in science and industry, and they use this with nuclear reactor parts and shrouds right. and pressure vessels, too, where they can assess the properties of the material or metal or component right. or system without actually causing damage. And it's not in... It's like an ultrasound, um, magnetic yes. particle, yes. liquid penetrance, uh, radiographs. Right. Right. Um, eddy, something called eddy current testing. Right. And low coherence interferometry. Mm -hmm. And they are they are exactly looking for the Wigner effect. That those are all technologies that would be used to assess the Wigner damage. They they commonly use this besides in the nuke industry. They use it in forensic engineering. Yeah. Yeah and mechanical engineering, right. electrical engineering. So, I mean, th this, is a, this is nothing new. In engineering, you have to know rates of entropy in order to know how big or how thick or how heavy to build something. That's right. Another really good point, Larry, that you brought up with the military planes. Mm -hmm. In the electrical charge that builds up on aircraft, and how it's much greater with the military planes because of the... Um, Their flight parameters, the places they go, the speeds they go at. Yes, they actually have to have their windshields grounded prior to pilots getting out of the cockpit because of the massive amounts of voltage that can build they up have even to... on short flights. And this happens as well on helicopters. Uh because of the blade rotation. Yeah. Sure, they had helicopters that hang grounding straps right off of them, just like you used to see hanging off of cars in America in the 50s. All of these types of things happen. They, helicopters can actually generate 50,000 volts in half a second. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that's also why they ground hoist cables when they have to do rescues. Uh, yep. Or else they'll shock the rescuer and the person in the basket. Pneumonia, the cross touches, sure. So it's very interesting how all these things are tying together. Yes, unintended consequences. Uh, it's all part and parcel of, of electricity. It's the flow of waves. It's where energy, matter, and effect meet. And then when you start doing it at atomic levels, now you're talking. When you when you start doing it in the spectrum that you're in, or the, or the radio interference spectrum, where you're starting to use energies in order to exert forces at distances, now you're starting to really talk. Using those forces in order to uh, accumulate and trigger other natural forces in a focused fashion, these are things that are worked on. And what it is actually is it's the interplay of Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. Energy 
which is waveforms, equals mass, which is matter as we know it, what makes our physical world, times a constant, the speed of light squared. And so what it means is everything in the universe is either in waveforms or it's in mass or, or it's matter. Or in transition. Or it's in transition. And so when you're pumping energy, new energy, high energy into matter, you're changing it. You're changing it into more matter or you're changing it into more energy. And the question becomes, how do you change it? That levers the energies involved, the inputs and the outputs. And so the airline industry, since we've been doing our talks, um, Christina, on the Wigner effect in the airline industry, um, I'm seeing more and more articles and information about how they are planning to build planes in the future. And I'd like Larry to talk about the plastic that was just discovered. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> and um, how they will have to return to old mechanics like the screw. They're either going to have to go forward one giant step or they're going to have to take one giant step backwards because the way they're building them right now is not going to work. Okay, so go backwards first. Okay, the first one's the backwards step. You go back to your heavier components. Okay, we're doing subsonic flight here. So there are a lot of different approaches to things. Bell cranks and hard uh, control uh, arms. Thing, things that put direct mechanical contact and then size factors in place, reinforcements, those types of things. Talk, talk, things talk. like worm gears. Yeah, worm gears. And worm gears are the ones you have to stay on top of assiduously and lubricate, which is the problem with them, which is what actually makes the other one easier. Uh, but you can do closed hydraulic assists called dash pots. Now, these things are not going to be quite as subject to the same problems that an active, a pressurized system would be uh, uh, susceptible to. You can also utilize uh, counter forces on surfaces the way they did on uh, rudders and uh, on uh, elevators on the uh, German aircraft in World War I and later. Those types of things will all work at subsonic speeds. Explain, now, explain how the pilots um, used to um, put the landing gear up and down from their seats. <laughs> well, uh, it's a question of did a system fail because as a backup you can literally can crank down certain types of, of landing gear and if you're going to have a failure in a hydraulic system, it is advisable to have some type of an other mechanical backup. It's a good way of going. So you've got all of, of those things. Now, the next point that we wanted to make was which? Because that's oh, kind of the, worth it. Yes, the next point is in the future, that, pl uh, that plastic coating. Okay, the, the, how it is that they're going to need to build techniques available to them now and materials that have come down the road suddenly and, and in fascinating fashion that will make certain types of assemblies a, a bit more manageable in the future. As far as the overbuild goes, that's where you start putting the hydraulics inside of, of heavy fittings and you have uh, heavy fittings that you aren't doing crimpings. What they're doing is they're doing joints. And those types of things are much, much less susceptible. And in the high pressure systems, those types of things will have a longer life duration. However, what you're really looking for is you're really looking for the Holy Grail. And the Holy Grail is what do you have around that can heal itself while all of these things are happening to it. So lo and behold, in a laboratory somewhere, uh, a young uh, associate researcher, somebody who's pretty new in the house, is making coffee while they're making a simple plastic and they forget an, a step in the synthesis of this plastic and lo and behold a new 
plastic is developed and this new plastic has some interesting properties um, it goes into three different states it can be put into a fluid state and in that fluid state it can be made to flow rejoin and when brought back out of that fluid state lo and behold its physical integral structure is back 100 percent where it started from it's self-healing now let me explain something to you about things uh, miracles of this variety <laughs> that happen in laboratories okay because these sorts of patents don't usually just suddenly occur because somebody was making coffee. That's not how it works. Most of this work was already done a long time ago, especially in plastics. So what you have to understand is, is that every now and then something's so good that it gets put on a shelf. One of the more obvious examples to me was the fact that water burns beautifully, can be made to aspirate in conjunction with a little bit of gasoline, and all of a sudden you've got something that really combusts, and not only does it really combust, but it combusts really clean. Now, what you've done is you've raised your efficiencies by like 600%, and of uh, both your consumption of, of the fluids and, and in your output. Uh, this is a bit of a problem for petroleum industry who's attempting to uh, sell you a product that they say is uh, a non-renewable product and that they want you all constantly worried about running out of. Two things there, it's renewable. And the other thing is, is it's better not to burn it because it actually is a poison. And that's the real program, is that they want to do some more eugenics with the fumes. Having said all of that, the patents for burning water in the internal combustion engine were shelved immediately upon their realization by the petroleum industry that they existed. They were brought off of the shelf during World War II, which is what made the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine such a beast. That thing burning water was a lot of horsepower, and it went very high, and it went very fast. It was a good thing. They put that patent back on the shelf at the end of World War II. I discovered it in uh, Mother Earth News back in the very early 70s, and I put it into a Camaro and drove it for five years. <laughs> this is how I know what the efficiencies are. This stuff works. These patents get shelved. It's all hidden in the background. And then when they are ready to finance yeah. the next factory and their controlled build and rollout, the miracle of the coffee cup occurs once again. And that young woman who discovered this magical uh, plastic on her coffee break got a B plus in the class because she was a woman oh and and, by and her professor got the patent <laughs> that's really? how it works wow. yes which was immediately handed back over to wherever it came from yeah it went back on the shelf right? no it's not off the shelf now they actually put it in the public domain they did a cut that with a couple of things they oh. want these things out there now oh, now they're ready they're ready and they want to control the output and the production of it so you have to go to yeah. one of the places where when you order it, you order 10,000 of them. <laughs> go ahead. Loren please. and Larry, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to call you back because my Skype is acting weird. Okay. All right.